who are what's going on with us. So um, this section is going to be our last section. So um, sort of my idea of what's going to be happening. So um, today we'll finish, we may finish up section 6.3, if not today and Monday 6.3. And then um, Wednesday, we might talk about um, some freeze patterns or pool table. We haven't done our pool table problems. So we might do that or we might do some freeze patterns. Do on Thursday, will be your exam three. And um, on Saturday, I'll post the review for that. And then on Wednesday, I'll go ahead and um, send out the exam, and then it'll be due on Thursday. Is this exam going to be conducted the same way the last one was? Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, so um, and this weekend, I will write each of you comments about what you missed on the exam so that those things, hopefully, if you have questions about them, we can um, discuss them either in a Zoom office hour or we can email back and forth about those on exam two. Okay, so does that make sense to everybody what we're gonna be doing for the next week? Question. Looks good. Okay, all right, so we left off Courtney, what was the last theorem we proved? Um, theorem 6.2.6. .6. Okay, so we have two more to go. So we have theorem 6.2.7, which talks about what happens when we have a chord, well, we have two tangents, and this is measurement K out here, and this is measurement J for this. So we have two tangents, and we'd like to, and this is angle one in here, and we'd like to say that the measure, so what we're trying to prove is the measure of angle one is equal to one half K degrees minus J degrees. So essentially, if you've noticed, except for when we have the secant lines inside, all the rest of the, that's a sum. All the rest of these to figure out the angle, it's always the difference of the two arcs. So let's look and see what happens here for this one. What do we think we should do here? What kind of construction should we do? Remember, these are tangents. Right. Should we draw, uh, well, should we draw 
uh, radii that meet at the tangent point and that and that would form a right angle with the lines that are tangent. Okay. So we have suggestion of drawing in the two radii. Is there anything else that we think we might want to do as far as construction? What about a diameter? Well, we have to be careful. I'm not sure if we want a diameter, but we probably along those lines, and this might have been what you were thinking, Courtney, is to construct the line segment that joins P and O, the center? Yeah. Okay. So in other words, it's not just a diameter, it is the line segment that's joining O and P. Okay. Now, Melinda mentioned that these are right angles. So what kind of triangles do we have? Congruent right triangles. Why are they congruent? By HL, they have the same hypotenuse and they have the same radius. I mean, radius are congruent, so by okay. HL, they are congruent. Okay, so along those lines, um, later on, on 6.3, we have a theorem about the lengths of AP and BP. So Guy just proves something for us. Well, actually, he didn't quite get to that conclusion, but close enough. If you look at the picture that on the second row, the middle one, notice it says that the lengths of the tangents that meet at P are the same. Guy just proved that theorem for us. So we're gonna skip over the proof of that theorem. Does that make sense to everybody? Are we okay with that? All right, so we now know that these two sides are congruent. Okay. So now what can we talk about in this? So if we draw the chord AB, what kind of triangle is triangle APB? Isosceles. So if we look, we know that we have what is true about, we'll call this angle two and this angle three. We know that angle two is congruent to angle three because isosceles goes ahead and does what? It implies that the base angles are congruent. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So let's talk about measures, and I'm not gonna write down every single reason here, but we have some So we know that 180 degrees is equal to the measure of angle one plus the measure of angle two plus the measure of angle three because the sum of the interior angles of a triangle, the sum of the measure of the interior angles of a triangle is equal to 180. Now, we also know something about the measure of angle two and the measure of angle three, because those are
They're congruent, so you can replace one with the other? Well, even more so, what do we know about the measure of an angle that's formed by a chord and a tangent line? Equals half of the arc, J, in this case. The measure of the arc. So this is one half J degrees plus one half J degrees, well, one half. That's a good one. I got <laughs> J degrees too quickly in there. One half J degrees. Okay. We also know that 360 is equal to J degrees plus K degrees. If we add up the arcs of a circle, the measure of the arcs, we get 360 degrees. So 180 degrees is equal to one half J degrees plus one half K degrees. So I now have the measure of angle one plus J degrees is equal to one half J degrees plus one half K degrees. So guess what I can do to both sides of this now? Minus J. Okay. So we have the measure of angle one is equal to one half K degrees minus J degrees. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay, so our final theorem for section 6.2 is if two parallel lines intersect a circle, the intercepted arcs between these are congruent. So we're supposed to prove that arc AC is congruent to arc BD. So Courtney, any suggestions as to what we might want to go ahead and construct here? I don't know. Would it be help? Would it help to construct like segments from BC to AD? Or? Okay. So we'll go ahead and construct the BC. We'll just do one of them. Okay. Okay. Now these are parallel lines. Remember, we're given AD is parallel to CD. So, I'm gonna call this one and this two so we don't have a lot of alphabet soup going on. So, let's see. Catherine, what can I say about angle one and angle two? They're congruent. Okay, why? Because interior angles are congruent. Okay, parallel implies alternate interior angles congruent. Okay, question on that. Okay, so what do we know about arcs that are intercepted 
by inscribed angles of the same measure or congruent angles. What does that tell us about these two arcs? Arc AC and arc BD? I believe they'd be congruent as well. Right. So congruent inscribed implies congruent intercepted arcs. Does that make sense to everybody? Now, we've proven this already, right? Because the measure of angle B is equal to one half the measure of arc AC. Measure of angle B is equal to the measure of angle C, which equals one half the measure of arc BD. So those two measures are the same which means the angles are congruent so that's that's the lemma or corollary well it would be a lemma because we use that to prove that question on that theorem does that make sense to everybody okay so in section 6.3 we have a couple of theorems about the perpendicular to a chord. The first one says, if a line is drawn through the center of a circle perpendicular to a chord, then it bisects the chord and its arc. The bisecting the chord We really proved that before, but let's go ahead and look at the picture and sort of give an outline of the proof. So this says, suppose we have a chord and we have a line is drawn through the center of a circle perpendicular to a chord. So it's through the center of the circle. This is our center. We're going to construct, and here's our chord AB. We're going to construct the radii. And Guy can tell us once again, since these are right triangles, we're going to get them congruent by what, Guy? Uh, HL. And so since they're congruent, that says that these two segments are congruent, so that says it bisects. These two angles are congruent. And what do we know, Courtney, if we have congruent Central angles, what's true about the arcs? Uh, that they're also congruent. Right. So does everybody see how that proof goes for theorem 6.3.1? Question on that. Yeah. All right. So Melinda's discovered the thumbs up. <laughs> Next up, we have 6.3.2. In 6.3.2, we have, if a line through the center of a circle bisects a chord other than a diameter, and it is perpendicular to the chord. So, if it bisects the chord, how are we gonna get these, con these two triangles congruent? So in other words, here, so for theorem 6.3.2, Two. This time, instead of having the right angle, we're trying to prove that it's a right angle, but we're told that it bisects the chord. 
So this time, Ting Ting, how are we going to prove those two triangles? I'll call this P. How are we going to prove those two triangles are congruent? S, S, S. Exactly. And since it's S, 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 we know these two angles are congruent. Remember, our definition for perpendicular is that what? Perpendicular means adjacent angles are congruent. So just from that, we have the fact that that line is going to be perpendicular. Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Going once, going twice. Okay. Theorem 6.3.3, 3. the perpendicular bisector of a chord contains the center of the circle. Hmm. When we're trying to show something contains something, what method of proof, Melinda, should we use? That seems indirect in that case. Right. So what we would assume is we would assume that it didn't. And then from the center of the circle, we would go ahead and construct a perpendicular. And then we go ahead and look at that particular triangle, okay, and be able to do what about that? What do we think? How do we think we'd go about this? So we'd say that, assume that the radius doesn't and that we construct another one that does. And what do you think we're going to contradict when we're all done with that? Are we going to end up with radii that don't, that aren't congruent? I, I guess I need a picture to see okay. if, when we're constructing that, that thing that doesn't um, include the center. I'm, I'm wondering what that looks like. Okay. So in other words, here it says that it has to go through the center. So let's look at it not going so I'm going to have to go off a little, right? So, so we'll go, we can either go what? Um, under or over to construct this. So we'll go, suppose we go up above. So how is that going to help us? So we're going to look at some triangles and what should happen with this angle between the diameter and the line that's not the diameter when we're all done. What should that measure be? Zero. Okay. So we could look at that measure being zero. We could also look at the fact that um, we can try to come up with what's happening with these triangles, okay, and how those triangles are going to be congruent or not, okay. But the easiest thing would be to what show that that angle is going to wind up to be zero. So that's sort of the outline of how to go about proving that. We'll talk about the exact proof because I really want to get to um, looking at the proportionalities on those um, four figures that you have, starting with the last one on the first line for 6.2 and then the other two. So we'll come back to this one and we'll come back to the definitions about um, tangency after, well, maybe not after. We said 6.3 might continue on to Monday. Looks like it will.
So let's look at proving at least one of those relationships. So the theorem 6.3.4, the tangent segments to a circle from an external point are congruent. Guy did that, thank you Guy. Guy did that for us. We already proved that when we were proving that the angle formed by those two tangents was equal to the difference. Everybody remember how we got that by drawing those two right triangles that were congruent with the hypotenuse leg. The next one is if two chords intersect within a circle, then the product of the lengths of the segments of one chord is equal to the product of the lengths of the segment of the other chord. Okay, so. So we have A, B, C, D. Okay. So we said what we could do is somehow we could come up with similar triangles because Similar triangles will give us ratios and proportions, and so then we can multiply by the common denominator and get an expression that looks like A times B equals C times D. So we're going to sketch in chords A, B, and C, D. So let's talk about the in-between steps. First of all, we want to prove that A times B is equal to C times D. An intermediate step is to prove triangle A, B, P is similar to triangle C, let's see, we want D, P, C. Think about why those are true while I make sure I have everybody who's in attendance today checked off. So do I have those in the right order for similarity? No. Okay. So remember we had a theorem that said that inscribed angles intercepted by the same and intercept the same arc are congruent. So that means that if we call this one and we call this two, and we call this three, and we call this four. We know that angle one is congruent to angle three, and angle four is congruent to angle two. So by AA, we have similarity. We could also use what vertical angles. 
So we could get two angles either using angle one and angle three and the vertical angles or angle four and angle two using vertical angles or the combination that we have here. Now that we have them similar, this is where we have to be careful. So I'm going to put in arcs to indicate the congruent angles. So angle one is congruent to angle three, and angle two is congruent to angle four. So I'm going to take the side of the triangle that is opposite angle three, which is D, And so that means that for the other triangle, I'm going to take the side that is opposite angle one, which is B. A is opposite angle four, and C is opposite angle two. Everybody follow how I decided on my proportionality. So it's really important to indicate which angles are congruent to make sure that you're writing down the right lengths of the sides that are opposite those. And now all we have to do is multiply through by our common denominator. And we have our proportionality. Question on that? Okay, let's look at our next theorem. It says, if two secant segments are drawn to the circle from an external point, then the products of the lengths of each secant with the length of its external segment are equal. So we have S for the entire length, and we have E C and E So we have R and then if we look at our diagram, we have C and E for these lengths. Everybody good with the labeling. So what we're supposed to prove is that, this is theorem 6.5, Three point six prove S times E equals R times C. Okay. So what triangles can we get to be similar? What things do we have to construct? So we have A, B, C, D. A, C, and B, D. Okay, so we're gonna construct A, C, and B, D. So our intermediate step is going to be to prove triangle APC is similar to triangle DPC. 
P V. So once again, we'll label this angle out here one, this angle two, and this angle three. Do we all agree angle one is congruent to angle one? By Catherine, why are those two angles congruent? Identity. Okay. So an angle two is congruent to angle three. Prospero, why are those congruent? Prospero, any thoughts? Um. Oh, um, they make this, they have the same angle on the arc. BC. They have the same arc, right. They're inscribed angles that intercept the same arc, so they're going to be congruent. So then we have tri those two triangles congruent, right? Not congruent, excuse me. Those two triangles are similar. Triangle A, P, C is similar to triangle D, P, V. So we know S is to C. As R is to E. So the very long side of triangle APC is to the short side, as the long side is to the short side. And so we just do our multiply by the common denominator, and we get S times E is equal to R times C. Question on that. Okay, all right. So we will, on Monday, we will prove the last of those, which is what happens when we have a tangent and a secant. We get the length of the tangent squared equals the long length times the short length of the secant. All right, and we'll also go back and prove theorem 6.3.3. All right, so you have assignments due. We'll have a review for the exam. Um, I should post that tomorrow, and we'll talk about that on Monday and Wednesday. And then um, Friday, we'll talk about reviewing for the final. Okay, that's it for today. Have a great weekend. And uh, Melinda Guy, I will be adding those points now that the um, assignment is due. Okay. So they did, you have made corrections in WebAssign by them, <laughs> by telling me I sent the report in and they're, they corrected it. If they didn't correct it for our assignment, I would have had to throw out our assignment and make it up again in order for it to be corrected. So, thank you. All so right. If, um, you know, the next web assign, if we need more time or you, it, there's a place to ask for an extension, is that, um, does that work out for you if we do that? Yes. Okay, cool. Yep. All you have to do is, is um, click on that, there's a place to write a little note and then send it off to me. So. Okay. All right, have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks, you too. You too. All right, bye. 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 bye.